Robert Seymour, farmer and owner of the property South Killanoola. I'm Dean Eastwood, been manager here for nine years for the Seymour family. I'm positioning myself to be the sixth generation farmer and owner of South Killanoola. I live on the farm with my wife Anne and three children, Oscar, Charlie and Phoebe. The Seymours settled here in about 1847. Henry, the pioneer, he was actually a lawyer, but he had a love of the land and he came from Galway, family of about nine. He sent the boys all looking for land. One son went to New Zealand and bought property there, but they came to the southeast and decided to settle here. They called it Killanoola. Then later on during my life, I purchased South Killanoola. Well, currently South Killanoola has expanded to about 3,000 hectares. So we run three enterprises. We run a cropping business, beef and a sheep operation. About 1,500 hectares of crop. We've got about 980 cows to calve in 2021. We're on about 7,200 composite ewes. We've got a Hampshire Down stud, our oldest registered stud in Australia. So we've been in land plan for five years, which involves fair bit of work. So you know, tagging at birth. And our clients have asked for it. And certainly some of them are looking for, you know, positive fat, lower birth weights. Traditionally for us, our market for our Hampshire Down Rams has been for ewe lamb joiners. The Hampies are, have a pretty small lamb, so, uh, and they're pretty easy of lambing. George Miller, a film director, wanted to purchase some Hampshire sheep for the film Babe, which he was making. So yes, we agreed and we took the ewes across to New South Wales for the filming. But anyhow, that was a good advertisement for Hampshire's. When I left school, I did a law degree. My father was a little concerned that I might digress, so he sent me Jackarooey. In 1961, I came back to the farm. I was here until 1977, and then I went to the Victorian farm. After I finished school, I took the opportunity to go up to the Northern Territory, got an interest in aviation, got a commercial flying licence, stepped up into the domestic airlines and then into the international airlines which took me. I've lived in Singapore, Dubai and in Turkey. So for me, coming in from an outside profession to come back onto the farm, I can identify skills, you know, I know that I can't compete with someone who's been working full-time as a manager and it's just good business to have the best person doing the best job you know so that's not not an issue with me. So the staff structure at South Killanoola is myself as manager, um, my wife handles all the business administration and compliance. Hi I'm Jenny Eastwood, I'm Dean Eastwood's wife, do the administrative work here at South Killanoola for CC Seymour & Co and we live here on the farm. Well, we've currently got four full-time staff members. Generally start at 7.30 and Dean will go down and meet them and dish out the jobs for the morning. We try and all sort of meet for morning smoko as well. It's not a bad time just for everyone to just chat about what they're up to or what's going on or any issues. We've had an agronomist here for nearly six years now with us. And he's been a real game changer. Phil does all our agronomy. Uh, he's got a dairy farm as well himself, so he's got a bit of fat in the game and can help us through all the principles of it. We're a phalaris and subclover based pasture. That's where we end up at. We've got a rotation going. We'll renovate back to permanent phalaris based pasture, about 100 hectares a year. And there's about 300 hectares in the system at any one time. They're either in uh, brassica crops or they'll be in annual ryegrasses. So we'll use annual ryegrasses and brassicas to clean them before we go back to generally a, a phalaris based pasture. So we do an AI program. Uh, we join in mid-May for a mid-February calving. So the heifers are calved about a month ahead of the cows. 
Initially, we did it as a labor saving. We thought that we could probably, by condensing the carving, we could save time in checking heifers. It probably hasn't worked out that way. With using shorter gestation length bulls, our heifers start calving about 10 days ahead of them start date anyway. But we've kept it going because it just gives the heifers more opportunity to get back in calf. We're putting better genetics into the herd. We can actually manipulate feed a bit better that we know we've got X amount of heifers calving very early and then we'll have a break to in the next batch. We've traditionally always had a Hereford herd here. So we've got Hereford bred back to Hereford bulls, black baldy cows, and we've got straight bred Angus cows. So they're all joined as a bit of a mix, other than the Herefords are always joined back to Hereford cow and then Hereford bulls back over Angus. The EBVs that we choose for the AI program and for the cow program aren't a lot different. The difference generally is that they'll be just better figured bulls in the AI program, bulls that probably in reality as a commercial breed I can't afford. So they'll be those real curve bender, really high, top 10% for 400 day, 600 day, but a really low birth. They may well be a one or a two for birth, maybe negative 10 for gestation length. So they're generally bulls that we couldn't afford within the AI program. We want a little bit of fat on our cows, then we look into the cow herd, not much changes. Really want to be top 20% for 400 day. We want to be breed average for 600 day, breed average for milk, positive for ribbon rump, breed average for IMF, and probably cap birth weight at, at five to five and a half. But we'll look at that a little bit better. If the bull's got the right structure and he's got a negative for gestation length, we'll probably look at him then. We work on the theory that we basically retain probably 90 to 95 percent of the heifers. We'll only probably take the real tail out of the heifers in about April. Then we'll let the bull have the first choice. You know, these heifers are sort of 14, 14 and a half months. They're not fully mature, so numbers give us options whether we want to grow the herd or if we have a land acquisition, we can, you know, we can easily stock it. So. Well, there's bread well, fed well within the sheep industry and Jason Tromp did a few days with the bread well, fed well within the beef industry and we sort of took a bit out of that. So we thought that the best thing was to just find the right genetics that suited us and EBVs that suit us and not be too upset about where we buy from. Having said that, look, we're very, very lucky that in the lower southeast that I've got some cracking good studs to buy from and source our bulls from there. So the heifers carve in February for six weeks. And the cows start about mid-March for six weeks as well. We've always been and traditionally been a, a weaner production system. So selling a mo the bulk of our calves in November, December, January. We will keep calves longer if we've got feed availability, but I'm conscious too that we don't end up taking feed out of the mouth of a heifer and do her some detriment going into the autumn, expecting her to come back into the herd. So we've always been a traditional weaner market. So we're considering going to a end of July calving. That'll allow us to grow more feed through the autumn period for more ewes and then have a spring calving herd. It's a decision we can only make once and if we, you can't go back from that within a cow herd. And I think Digby made the comment only recently that you just want to make sure we do that change for all the right reasons rather than following everyone else down the line. This year will be about 7,200 ewes. We use Paradu and Cloven Hills genetics. We land for 17 days starting the 17th of June. We have a, about a 25 day break and then we have another 17 day lambing. In our mixed age use, our ewe lambs start about the same time as our round two ewe start lambings. We join them at the end of February. They'll lamb about the end of July, start of August. We're trying to target a ewe that's nine months of age. We'd like to see her better than 55 kilos. It works and it's worth, we're trying to keep persevering with it. And the data that we get from composite sheep breeders is pretty immense. So we've actually now employed Steve Cotton from Dynamic Ed to help me get through it all and decipher all the data. There's probably 50% more data than what's in a EBV for cattle. So the, the rams that we're looking to buy for the commercial side of the flock, we want the rams to be top 20% for weaning weight, birth weight, adult mature weight, but we'll cap that at 15. We don't want them too big. We'd like to see them positive for fat. We'd like to see them in the top 10% for eye muscle area. And then if we've got to do another selection criteria, we'll split them on number of lambs weaned. So really what we're trying to do is get a, a lamb that's going to grow really, really, really fast to 12 months, to 15 months, and then she stops and works within our ewe lamb joining program. We still want to target that 1500 kilograms of dry matter. So ewes are generally 20 to 25 days on lambing sites and they're gone, so they're not chewing a lot of feed out. We really do follow the, you know, lambs alive, 
lamb survival. Lamb survival has probably become our biggest thing now. We don't talk too much about number of lambs marked. For us, it's number of lambs that have survived. Singles, we're not too stressed. We'll take them up to sort of mobs of maybe 400. Twin bearing ewes, we try and be in mobs of below 100. And our triplets are in mobs of below 30. So we use portable electric fencing and we just split up all our paddocks. Our paddocks range in size from 50 to 20 hectares. We're seeing that we can stock ewes at 11 and 12 to 15 ewes to the hectare and we don't get a drop in survival. So it shows us that we can push them fairly tight into small areas and have high survival. This year I think we were about the 52 lambing sites. We put up about 52k of portable electric fencing and about 500 electric fence posts and they stay up for about six weeks. I suppose South Kiln is a little bit different to a lot of people in this area, that we, we have a share farmer that manages and controls the day-to-day -day running of, of the program and he really controls that every day and determines what happens. About 11 or 1,200 hectares in both leased and owned cropping country. We'll have wheat, beans and canola. Some of that will be grazing canolas, which we've just included in the system. So we sow that in September. We'll be grazing that in January and we'll run that right through till June and then lock them up and take them through as a grain crop. Really, we'd like to see it, you know, high three to three and a half tonne crop. You know, last year's returns were phenomenal and then with the return that we're gonna get out of canola, it's been really good. I suppose it's given us confidence. We did 120 hectares dry land last year and this year we'll have about 85 hectares under irrigation. Top of that, we grow, we've got small seeds production, so we grow clover seed, Falera seed, Lucent seed, but Bruce controls that. Bruce McLean's our share farmer, and yeah, that's that's his baby. The dung beetles have been quite well promoted through, you know, McKillop Group and various other farming seminars and things that we've had here. They love horse manure or cattle manure, and we've seen obvious benefits of how they take the the dung down into the soil and the burrowing effects and all the benefits of that into the natural soils and even to the effect of worms you know we can save on drenching. Recently we've set up a nursery it's a very simple process they mail you the setup materials to create your nursery and then about a week later the beetles arrive. They're meant to stay there for approximately three months and you just put in three to four day old manure not too fresh but not too hard and establish a colony and eventually you know they will release them and they'll uh, hopefully spread over the farm and and over our neighbours. We're happy to do our little bit to encourage them. One of the big things in succession is you need to discuss it with your family and be completely transparent. It was, it was established from that first input that we didn't want to run the whole thing as as one, we all wanted to split everything into our own and it was all very transparent. So the three properties, Digby at South Killanoola, Sarah at Yatnat, Tom at Corobna Dairy and Nicholas has started an organic farm also at Yatnat. And there's been a few changes along the way and there'll be a few more. It's not a fix, you don't just sort of sign on the bottom line and agree to something, it's a perpetual motion. But I think that's the key to succession. It's not the succession itself, it's the communication to start the process. And even if the succession fails, the fact that you've had the conversation mitigates the damage of a fail of not having a plan at all. I've done wean more lambs, lambs alive. We're also involved with McKillop Farm Group, lucky enough to be chairman of the livestock committee. And they're really good, they're locally based and allow some demonstration sites within the southeast, which is funded by MLA around the cattle industry. And the plan is, I think, that they're talking that that's going to be along the lines of lifetime you. So we're involved with one on wiener production and growing your wieners out better, whether that's steers or heifers. I'm involved with another one which is heifer management and trying to retain more heifers and keep them into their second calving uh, and getting them back in calf because that's probably the biggest issue we have with them is retaining them in the herd after their first calving. 
we're in our third year of EID within the flock. We're slightly doing it. Every year, our composite ewe lambs are all being tagged. They're then allocated to whether they're an early or a late, a twin or a single. And this year, we've just started to allocate where we can sire, so we know what sire group they've come from, and then tracing them through so we can get a bit of data on them. Because the hope is that when we reach a steady state, we can then perhaps put selection pressure on those ewes. So yeah, try and use that data a bit more. So we've got a Clipex sheep handler. It'll weigh sort of five to 700 an hour, depending on how they flow. But it also takes the labour and the strain out of handling composite ewes and drenching and vaccinating. So a bit more efficacy there with that. Stick reader gets a heck of a lot of use. It's probably the nearly the most used bit of gear. It's amazing how many times we all go for a stick reader for doing something. All the cows are scanned. It gives us an alert file and we know who's not in calf. We use it also preg scanning with our heifers. So we know who's in calf to the AI. This year we actually fetal age for three periods. Still running just large contemporary mobs, but come after Christmas, setting them up for calving, we'll split all them and we don't have to worry about reading tag numbers. It's all electronically recorded and we'll just go through with a wand and, and draft them off the EID this year. The pumps on South Carolina are all on text message alert and they're all on so watchdog alerts. Three main pumps that run the property. Two of those are pressure-based systems and one just pumps the tanks. So they're a little bit different in how they do it, but they've all got high and low pressure cutoff. So they send us a text message every morning. And then if the pumps stop for any reason or lose pressure or go through, blow out on high pressure, they send me a text to say to go and check. And all those pumps we can stop and start by text message. It doesn't stop us from still having to go and check water tanks and still check troughs, but it's at least we know the pumps are going. Been with AgriWeb for probably nearly seven years. We find it really good. So we've got the majority of the staff are on it and they're recording everything live of what they're doing. We'll start to do a bit more on the pasture management and measurement and growth rate side of it. That's probably the next step with it. But AgriWeb's been really, really good to us. The next generation now need to plan, and I have nine grandchildren. You know, it's not that far away from there, succession planning. Big things in biosecurity we're big on, and we'd love to embrace, you know, the carbon side of things too when we get some more information. So we're pretty much on the front foot as far as the latest farming and animal practices go, I think. Been here, you know, nine years November, and it's, it's been fantastic. The one thing that I've always felt is important with people employing me and, and hopefully with my own staff is that we care about them and Seymour's do that you know the, the family our family's a priority and you know we're made to feel welcome within their families as well so that's really important to us and has been with all our jobs that we've really enjoyed. All Laguna Mayo for fantastic communities and made us feel welcome since day one it's been brilliant. We certainly are making improvements. We've got a very large infrastructure program happening very early in 2022 with a new set of sheep yards, which is pretty exciting. Going forward from that, I think we're not far away from a new set of cattle yards. I'm looking forward to taking the business to the next step. You don't want to be the bloke that they go, he did a shoddy job and we've done a really good job of fixing it up. You know, it's important if I leave here that I've done the best I can for the business and, and looked after it and, you know, treated it as my own.